Welcome to the worship for the second Sunday of Lent. Blessed is the Lord who forgives all our sins. Hear the commandments of God to his people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. You shall not make for yourself any idol. You shall not invoke with malice the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Jesus said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us all in goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Genesis, beginning in the 17th chapter. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between you and me. And I will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring forever. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Our psalm response is a portion of Psalm 22. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line give glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of his... of his, My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. 
The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember him in return to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. Our second reading is from the letter to the Romans, beginning in the fourth chapter. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, and who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in his glory with his Father and the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning. So this morning, in the second Sunday of Lent, We have one of my favorite passages of scripture. I'll admit I have several favorite passages of scripture, Uh, but this is a good one because we don't, we don't see it in this particular short passage, but right before this passage, Peter, who gets called out in a rather, you know, emotionally painful way, um, right before this passage, Peter was recognized as the gold star student. Jesus asked a difficult question. Peter got it right. Jesus asked a difficult question that none of his students could find their way around. They couldn't even wrap their mind around it. And Peter just bust out with the right answer. And it was about who Jesus really is. 
And Peter bust out with the right answer. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. And, and Jesus looks at him and says, on that rock, I'm going to build a church. Now, that is like an ancient gold star. That is one of those scratch and sniff snicker, stickers that we all used to get when we were children, you know, before there was a pandemic. That was, that was 100% on a test plus extra bonus. That was extra credit. That was fantastic. And the very next event, <laughs> the very next thing we see is Peter, the student in question, possibly getting a little hoity-toity. And when Jesus starts being real and honest and saying that he's going to die, I'm saying too that he's going to be resurrected because death can't hold him. And he's saying it publicly and he's saying it openly. Peter, star number one student, pulls the teacher aside and said, would you shut up? My translation. And Jesus is not, is not buying into this pull me aside and rebuke me thing. And so he pulls Peter back into the crowd of students and addresses everybody and says, look, don't doubt me now. Don't try to stop me because you're focused on small things, human things. I'm doing a thing here. And it's good and it's beautiful and it's going to help many people. And it will be very uncomfortable for you. Again, my translation. And that's the tricky thing, isn't it? Sometimes when we do a thing that is good and beautiful and helps many people, it also has the capacity to make others uncomfortable. I mean, heck, just wearing a mask. It's become a political issue. But from a certain point of view, one could argue that wearing a mask during a pandemic that is transmitted on the breath is good and beneficial and helpful and a kind thing, a deeply kind thing to all other people. And it also has the capacity to make people very uncomfortable. And it has the capacity to be uncomfortable for those who wear the mask. Absolutely. And yet, it is something that so many people have recognized is the thing we do to keep our neighbors safe. Sometimes God calls us to do an uncomfortable thing. And it may be to step out in faith and try something new, to go left instead of right, to go right instead of left. But sometimes when God asks us into action, gives us the option to do God's will. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's uncomfortable to us and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it can be wonderfully comfortable to do God's will. It can be thrilling and exciting and full of peace and joy, even while it makes other people uncomfortable. But that's how God operates. When Jesus walked this earth, not many people understood him. Not many people became his followers. Yeah, sometimes he grew, drew crowds, 
but he often drew crowds when he was doing his most spectacular stuff, when he was feeding people, thousands of people from like five little fish, or alternately, depending on the story, two fish, two little fish, and five loaves of bread. Thousands of people. I'd show up, whether or not I believed. But the people who were dedicated, dedicated to him, the people who deeply wanted what he had to offer, whether or not they thoroughly understood it, at first they were counted in handfuls. A few handfuls of people over here, a few handfuls of people over there. And the crowds came when he started healing people of sickness. And the crowds came when he started exercising people. And certainly everyone was very interested in when he started raising people from the dead, which he did more than once. But as to changing their lives, handfuls. And yet 2,000 years later, I'm talking about him. And I think that is because despite all of the people who may have become Christian for all the wrong reasons, there have been people who have wanted what he had to offer, the peace that passes all understanding, a sense of joy and love in the world and with our neighbors, a closeness to God, a sense of mercy, a sense of justice. But you know, justice can make people uncomfortable too. Mercy can make people uncomfortable. Heck, one person being peaceful in the midst of anxiety can make people uncomfortable. There's really nothing about following God that doesn't have the power and the capacity to make others uncomfortable. But that is what we do. That's the goal that we strive toward. Amen. Our service continues with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and <clears throat> he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Almighty God, during this time of social distancing and self-quarantine, we ask that you remind us of our deep connection with one another. Help us to reach out in love and safe ways to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. Fill our hearts with compassion for those who must work with others and risk exposure, for those who need to work but cannot, for those juggling childcare and working from home, for those who have been infected by coronavirus, for all those who are suffering and in pain from other illnesses, we pray that they may be made well and whole once more. For all those who have died, for those filled with hope and those filled with despair, for those whose faith was clear and for those whose faith is known to you alone, 
We pray that they may rest in peace. We pray for our nation and for all those in authority, the president, the governor, our county executives, our local leaders, and the CDC, that they may make wise decisions and have right actions for the welfare and benefit of us all. We pray for Trinity Church, for Sarah, Michael, and Rose, for Andy, Joanne, and Bruce, for Linda and Ernie, for Joan, Matthew, and Lynn, for Michelle, JJ, Alana, and Mariah, for Bob, Bonnie, Louise, Ted, and Reggie, for Lorraine, Deb, Rich, Linda, Lena, Freya, Parker, Jackson, Jocelyn, Jordan, Chris, Colin, and Kelly, for Kathy and Joanne, for Chris and Judy, for Walter and Jane. We pray for our families, friends, and neighbors, especially Holy Apostles Perry and St. Luke's Attica, for all of our local churches here in Warsaw, and for Jamie, Pam, David, James and Barb D, Anne, George, Phil, Steve W, Bob M, Kathy and Michelle, and those others that you may name now. We pray for all those in the military and for those in the National Guard who have been mobilized for the safety and welfare of our nation. And especially we pray for Robert. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we're bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.